You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your murder mystery world tour, or is it your spooker Whoa. mystery world tour? Scary time. We are discussing <laughs> Alison Moore's Death and the Seaside, and we are talking part two of this novel, which is chapters seven to twelve. Herds, mm. Sylvia Slythe. Sylvia Slythe is awful. I hate her. I hate all these characters, mm. really. I think everybody except for Bonnie herself and and Chi, yeah, who we have not seen hide nor hair of since she disappeared mm-hmm. from the laboratory that she was cleaning in. Dude, has she been taken away? Look, I'm just saying. Who knows? I've read. These it was books interesting before. because last week on the show I was talking about how I believed a lot of what Sylvia said, mm-hmm. and I think. The scene that we have to get to to start here is obviously the dinner scene. Oh, it's so good. It's, it's sad, so though. good. It's a very sad scene. Well, the, the interesting thing is, is that Bonnie really feels like the victim in that scene. She and is? I don't think you will disagree in any way when you read it. Mm. But the thing that's curious about that is the way that her being a victim shakes out all other potential information from the scene. Like, sure. the thing I was saying I believed Sylvia saying last week was that she knew Bonnie's mother. Mm -hmm. But it never gets brought up until we get back from this dinner and Sylvia says, oh, yes, no, I don't think your mother recognized me. (laughs) But, like, why wouldn't you say something? It doesn't make any sense. You're right. Yeah. I mean, that entire scene is, as I said, it's very sad because uh, Bonnie has invited all of her best friends and family to her Mm -hmm. birthday party, which includes her parents who have already ordered and are eating their dinner, you know, long before yep. she gets there because she's late. And chastise um, her for And they it. chastise her. And then she's got Fiona there, which is her awful co-worker who's constantly daring her to do terrible things, like spit in people's pockets. Yep. Um, and we've got S- Sylvia Slythe, who is very quiet. And, like, we've seen her behavior throughout the book is to be very observational, uh-huh. right? She's like, oh, and how does that make you feel? And what does this mean in your story? But in this scene- Bonnie is getting the absolute short end of the stick and Sylvia says nothing. Yeah. And it's wild. It's also fascinating because one of the reasons I did believe Sylvia in the previous section of the book was that she had a bunch of interesting, fun facts about Bonnie's parents. Mm -hmm. And Sylvia basically gets there and is like, oh, so you ski. Mm -hmm. What's that like? You afraid of accidents? And- It begins as a weird question to Bonnie's parents, but immediately starts to feel like she is trying to intimidate Bonnie Mm. by bringing up all of the fears that they've been discussing in front of her parents without any context. Yeah, I mean, it feels like she's probing for information, right? Like, yeah, she's trying to understand Bonnie, but it's in a way that is really gross like she says you know you wear way too much makeup uh she doesn't comment on the pimple that bonnie's popped on us on her own face but that's mm-hmm. like even that she could have done something to help she should have con- showed some, some oh concern. my god the line where bonnie's father is like oh you eat a lot for a skinny girl to mm-hmm. fiona yeah and her mother's is like oh not like our bonnie who's well, always exactly. been a big girl yeah like ah yeah it's it's so interesting to have all these characters that are just c- treating Bonnie like nothing, and she is like nothing in the scene, which is what makes it mm. work so well. She has no s- scene presence at all. Yeah, like- The, the events happen to her. her. Her food is ordered for her, and yeah. there's this weird line where it feels like there's a bit of a time skip where as though everyone's just been sitting there watching and waiting for yeah. Bonnie to eat. Just it's watching so her uncomfortable. Eat. Yeah, even in the in the place where, because obviously Sylvia and, and Bonnie show up at the same time, they both order at the yeah. same time, but Sylvia's food shows up. And then when they say, hey, where's Bonnie's food? They're like, oh, I guess we didn't get another order. <laughs> like, yeah. as though, like, maybe it didn't go through at all. There was some craziness going on. Yeah, it's it's awful. Like, I feel really bad for Bonnie just reading this book. Yeah. It's getting to the point where, like, nobody seems to care about her. Mm-hmm. Not not truly. <laughs> it, it's terrible. It's terrible. Yeah, I mean, it's also the, the one positive thing that happens in that scene is- 
her parents uh, start talking about the trip that she's planning on taking with Sylvia mm. uh, as like a holiday. And Fiona well, points out yeah. that it's like weird to go on a trip with your landlady. It is. But it's like the one moment where everyone kind of says something nice, mm. but it's 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 kind of just Sylvia. Well, I mean, even that, that trip, it's- sort of being organized by the two of them, but it seems like it's it's mostly just Sylvia putting it together. Yeah. And in another context, this could be like, you know, Sylvia is her best friend. They're yin and yang, you know, they're living together and they have opposite approaches to things, but she's just trying to help Bonnie out, help her confront her problems. But that is not the vibe. I don't think that Sylvia cares about her, at least in the sense that you would care about another human being. Yeah. Uh, I'd say she cares about her more- as a little experiment, perhaps. Well, yeah, because that is uh, that is kind of the linking scene there, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Is chapter eleven, where we start going through Sylvia's history with experiments, mm. and I, I don't I don't want to lead you too much here, Herds. But what 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 did you think of this entire thing? Like, we know that Sylvia has a PhD, and she clearly has an interest. I mean, it it sounds like she's a psychologist to me. That is that is the vibe I'm getting. We talked last week about whether somebody had killed somebody else, whether Bonnie had like helped Susan commit suicide, that sort of thing. Yeah, it seems as though Sylvia is. Probably responsible for Susan's death and perhaps Bonnie's death if death re- if death repeats itself, if history repeats itself, uh-huh. uh, because she's obsessed with the ways that you can compel people to do things. Mm-hmm. It seems like because the whole that whole scene there is about Sylvia's grandmother saying like, "Don't don't you play with with those plates or you'll drop them." Yeah, and so of course she drops the plates. If you are thinking about something that could go wrong there is a higher chance that it will go wrong. It's the self-fulfilling prophecy sort of thing. Yeah, do not think about walking into the sea. Ah! Oh my goodness, I thought about walking into the sea. Crazy. And it's just happened to you, but the ocean has come up beneath us in the studio here, Herds. I know. All of this electrical equipment is is drowning. Sylvia is like simultaneously obsessed with debunking uh, the supernatural. She talks about the the seashell and how it's not actually the sound of the sea. But clearly she is interested in, once debunking the supernatural, talking about things that you would not think are real and and would happen to you, but but that could. Ties in, ties in really well with the sort of dreamlike quality and the, I don't want to say supernatural elements of this story. I want to say like just the elements that are coincidental or that are beyond the scope of what we would normally consider like reasonable, right? Meta ominous yeah, the, parts of the story. I want to say preternatural, but I don't know if I'm using that word right. I never remember. I exactly. don't think anyone else would either. So maybe you should <laughs> just do it, and now we can convince the Oxford English Dictionary to change. Preternatural is defined as beyond what is normal or natural. Autumn had arrived with preternatural speed. Mm-hmm. So maybe that is the right word. Maybe it is. It's a very vague word, but. I'll go with it. I'm glad we all learned something here today. That's what I'm here for. That's why I do this show. (laughs) Good, good. No other reason. Mm. Yeah, I think the other thing that's really fascinating about the sort of lead up into the scene with the dinner and the talk about experiments is that so much of the rest of that lead up feels so normal. Like there's this scene where they're just out talking about life, having tea in the backyard on a hot summer's day and like- (laughs) Smoking a cigarette. Like there's a bunch of very- short punchy chapters yeah where it it does feel like them just kind of hanging out which is what makes the dinner scene and the experiments discussion so exceptionally weird i mean even in those scenes sylvia is still like poking and prodding bonnie for details yeah so it's not entirely comfortable but yeah we're, we're doing that thing uh where we take normal situations and add a little bit of a little bit of horror, a little bit of spiciness to it to make it seem uncomfortable, right? It's that uncanny valley yes. sort of effect, um, as we discussed previously with Alex Pavesi on the show. Yeah, like there's the the moment at the end of that scene when they're out in the, the backyard or whatever where Bonnie is going to put out her cigarette and even though she has no shoes on, uh, her instinctive kind of compulsion is to put it out with her foot. We're taking those sort of normal scenes and twisting them just enough that there's like, 
a specter at the edge of our vision, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's also the the, the same thing with the tea, right? The tea that is mm. too hot to drink on a summer's day, and yet sure. they, they both clink clink mugs and then yeah. do not drink. So there's always this, this, this feeling of the action uncomplete. Yeah, they have that certain level of, of performativity, right? And that's, I mean, that's something that kind of defines their relationship, that when Sylvia shows up back in part one, like, well, let's have some tea. And she's like, you know, how do you have your tea? She's like, oh, you know, with milk. I ain't got no milk. And, you know, do you have sugar? No, I haven't got any sugar. Um, but they do it anyway. They still drink the tea because that's the thing to do with, with your landlady if they come calling. Even though I'm not sure. I mean, in Australia, I, I don't believe that it's like legal for the land land person to show up unannounced. I'm not I'm not really sure. I feel like I should know this. Well, it depends on d- depends on whether you're the sole renter or if it's a, a share yeah, property. You know what? Good point. Good point. <laughs> yeah, I'm not 100 percent certain of the legislation there, but I've definitely been under the impression that it's frowned upon. You're not really supposed to show up unannounced for tea. But I guess if the landlady has all the power, then what are, what are you going to do? Say no. I guess. The, the other fascinating thing character-wise is, of course, Susan's chapter at the beginning of this section. Mm. Um, we, we, have, we have just one Susan chapter per section so we far. Do. We see very little. But I feel like the linking is starting to get much more strong in this one. We see the, like, image of this guy. Oh, with the eyebrows. Uh, with the, like, yeah. eyes tattooed on the back of his skull. And then we talk later between Sylvia and Bonnie about like where she got that image from when she wrote it into her story. Mm -hmm. This character of Susan is starting to, I guess, in some ways be framed as more written Mm -hmm. because her world is being provided more external context than it was when we first met her. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, yeah, because the the tattoos on the the back of his head is from like a teacher who shaved his head for charity. Yeah. And obviously the smoking, now we have a much better understanding of where that comes from because that's something that um, that Bonnie also also does. Mm-hmm. And obviously we're learning a lot more about the, the seaside itself and the fact that Bonnie is apparently drawn to jump yes. from piers, which is a whole thing. Because <laughs> Susan also is like the, the guy with the eyes in the back of his head and his dog and there's like a thing when she goes up to her windowsill at night that all, you know, tell her to jump from those places. The discussions with Sylvia are all about like, oh, tell me why that's in your story in this very pokey, proddy way. But when we we do kind of start to see these framing devices with Bonnie kind of come together a bit more, I, I don't know how it felt to you, Herz, but it almost felt as though you could see Bonnie being in those situations a bit more directly sure. this time around. Yeah, sure. Like she's sort of externalizing her trauma rather than creating a parallel yeah i mean it's it's like as far as the story goes as far as bonnie like writing this character goes it's a way to i guess express the the feelings that she has the like suicidal feelings the feeling that she has to jump and where i guess we're getting a lot more kind of literal meaning to death in the seaside not that yeah. not, not just that the seaside is like a metaphor for death and it's the fourth wall and etc cetera, etc cetera, but like I feel like I need to go jump in a lake. Like that is uh-huh. literally apparently how she feels. Yep. Um, Sylvia asks her and it's like, how many times have you jumped off piers? And she's like, yeah, I, like like three or four. And then we stopped going to the seaside. Now, listen, Herds, you're the one that has to pick the the who, how, and why in this alleged murder mystery. Uh-huh. But uh, let, let's just begin by observing that it is mighty suspicious that Uh-oh. Sylvia, having heard that, says- Let's go on a holiday to the seaside. I know, I know. Isn't in, it just in a book that wasn't as eerie as this? <laughs> and it'd be like, yes, let's go face your fears. Well, exactly. In this book, I I was at full flight or fright. She's, bro. she's a predator. She's a predator. I am not excited for her taking Bonnie to the seaside, possibly to some kind of pier that she could whoa four letter word off of. Float, float. That's five. Flay. Flay off of. Flay. No, that doesn't work. Nice. Flay doesn't work. Anyhow, <laughs> you're listening to Death of the Reader. We are talking Alison Moore's Death and the Seaside. Step. No, Chapter that doesn't work. Seven to 12. <laughs> we'll be back with more in just a second. Stick around. You're listening to 2SER 107.3.
you're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex Herds here, Murder Mystery World Tour. And we are talking Alison Moore's Death and the Seaside. Herds, how far away are you from your nearest pier as we discuss chapters 7 to 12 uh, here on the show today? I think just a couple kilometers. I'm not that far. I'm, yeah. I'm kind of near the near the waterish. I reckon there could be a pier over there. Yeah. I've never been myself. Just wander down. Well, like the piers that I have memories of are the ones that I used to go to with my family when we go camping. Either because we, it was, it's like a, a pier next to a ramp that we need yep. to take the boat down. Because I used to take yes, a little, little metal boat down into the water so we could go fishing. Or a pier at, there was a particular beachside cafe I used to go to where I would always get chips and, and milkshake. Yeah. Um, and I'd feed the chips to the seagulls. Mm-hmm. It was very pleasant. I have nothing but good memories of piers, uh, at least in my own life. So that's good. Nice. I, on the other hand, jumped off a pier in Queensland. What? And uh, went to kind of swing myself underneath it. And in the process, sliced my foot open on an oyster. I think I've heard this story before. This wasn't that long ago. Was it? Uh, no, no. This was this was like decades ago. Oh, this is a different story. This is a different time that you dealt with oysters. Okay. Well, why were you trying you, to swing yourself? You may have. I, I don't think I've had that many bad run-ins with oysters. <laughs> you may just be conflating <laughs> anecdotes. No, no, no. I remember you had a story about how you almost fell into oysters, but then you like put your hand down or put your leg oh, down or something. Yeah, no, this was them. a few weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, st- I still I still have it's still different. healing on my leg as Completely we speak. Completely different story. But anyway, point is, no oysters, peers involved in that. Okay. Okay, good, good. The peers are just as cursed as they always are. I just been. wouldn't trust me around oysters, I guess, is the lesson we've learned today. I have I, I have a question for you. Yes. I need to know, why did you think that three, swinging underneath the pier was a good idea for you impressing somebody? Uh, no, it's because I'd seen crabs there and I wanted to go look at the crabs. Did you think that the, the crabs could swing under the pier and they would be fine with their hard shells? Uh, no, I, I could see them scuttling from up top and I, I wanted to get a closer look. Why did you swing? Why swing and not simply track down the rocks? Because uh, there's a oh, there weren't any rocks. This was like this is like a this, this was sticking out into a pretty pretty high tide situation. I would have had to have swum out. I see. And you feared the swimming. You thought maybe there was something in the deep that would get you. No, I was just standing there and figured it would be more convenient to uh, swing under than and- than to go the whole way out and back or to like jump off and try. You know, it was just it was, it was just a fun attempt. It's just a fun little adventure. And tell me, was it more convenient to slice your foot open? You know what? I've gotten a lot of mileage out of this anecdote, so I'm actually going to say <laughs> okay. yes. Very well, then. You're a perfectly healthy psychological individual. Oh, thank you. Please, thank you, Dr. Please, Sylvia Sly. Please leave. I don't think that Sylvia Sly talks in that particular accent. Maybe she you does. You can't prove that. <laughs> you know what? You... That's my headcanon now. She is yep. German psychologist doctor. Mm-hmm. Um, and I apologize to anybody who speaks German in such an accent. I will definitely do that again. <laughs> Anyway, so the mystery here, what's what's going on? What? I'm meant to be asking you that question. <laughs> you asked me about the pier. Now I'm just returning the favor. Well, I think, Herds, <laughs> that uh, I know the answer to this book. So you, you probably should be the one in answering your own question. It's terrible. It's terrible. Okay, fine. Reverse psychology, I see. Now I, mm-hmm. now I understand. Damn it. I've given away the ending. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sylvia Slythe is a bad scientist type character, clearly. She's like this psychologist lady who's like, man, wouldn't it be fun if I like got people to jump off cliffs through subliminal messaging? And that's what she's doing. I reckon she did it to Susan and now she's doing it to Bonnie. I mixed up the arcade and the, and the lab locations, but I, in my, in my process of checking this out, I realized she works at a full on research laboratory. Yeah. Is this the same laboratory that she used to work there and like experiment on the animals? Is that Wait, what this you think, is? You think Sylvia Slive used to do psychology experiments on animals? I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say yes. I think that that is why we have this like animal laboratory. Mm-hmm. And she used to like do her mad science research there. And she's doing it because she loves, she loves science. She wants to push the boundaries of what humans can be, let's say. Because it, it, the thing is, it explains why Fiona is able to like do the whole truth or dare thing with Bonnie because Bonnie feels compelled to do whatever the dares are that Fiona, you know, tells her to do. 
I reckon that Susan and Bonnie maybe were part of an experiment for a long time ago, like when they moved on from, from the animals to secure and trials. And, and that's why Bonnie's got all these weird compulsions, like getting a step out of cigarette with her foot and jumping off piers. And- right. So they, they were both being compelled by compelled. professional landlady Sylvia Slive. Yes. To jump off piers. To jump off piers and, and buildings. Sylvia gave in to these, uh, the, the, these, these compulsions, but Bonnie did not. And so Sylvia Slive has spent decades hunting since- Hunting her down, maybe? Hunting her down. I'm going to say yes. You don't live uh-huh. on Slasher Street if you're not going to hunt some people down from an old- Experiment. Yeah, you know what? That makes sense to me. <laughs> I would choose the streets that I live on purely based on their dramatic value. You didn't you didn't choose your street based on that reason? I I mean that's that's how I choose where I live. I don't look at the people. Listen, there. I'm not about to dox myself right me neither. now, birds, but <laughs> but I don't I don't I don't know what sort of dramatic value you think my current home address has. I look, I cannot speak to the value of it, but on my street High dramatic value. I am extremely happy. I have many jokes that I could make I know, about it, but that, but you that all not, involve doxing you. You better not dox me. Yeah. Uh-huh. So yeah, I'm going to say that Sylvia Slythe did a bunch of weird compulsion-based experiments on people, and Bonnie and Susan are the product of that. And that's why that's why she knows about her, her mother without them recognizing her, because Bonnie saw her, and she's just like blocked it out, let's say. Um, then the parent would never have to get involved. That all makes sense to me. Mad psychology science. Um, I don't know. Like the, the problem is I'd be, I'm kind of looking for like threads to tie up, but I feel like that is such, it's such an insane concept. I feel like it kind of encapsulates all I could ever want. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those peculiar situations where I could sit here and be like, oh, but herds, don't you think- it's too far fetched to suggest well, I, that I someone would. <laughs> would spend decades doing this thing to kill a particular young girl by compelling her to commit suicide in this very particular way. In Satan. In yes. Satan. And Satan. <laughs> you know, in a in a in a in a novel that wasn't like Death in the Seaside, you would say, you know what, Flex? It is that a little is, far-fetched. Is that my voice? I'm going to go back to the drawing board and reconsider my my plans. But in a novel like Death in the Seaside, I it's feel wild. like you have all the license in the world to just go, well, what else would Alison Moore do? I'm also going to say that she has disappeared because she, like, started coming to, to work less and less and less and then she just disappeared. Yeah. I'm going to say that Sylvia has, like, abducted her for more r- research. Because, you know, there's that room upstairs that has the blinky light. You reckon the cheese in there? Oh, wouldn't that be something? What? It, what tell, talk to me about the blinky light, Herds. Oh, I don't know. It's not blinky. It's just It's just like a room that's always got a light on. Uh-huh. It's It's on the other side of, um, uh, of, of Bonnie's door. You reckon that her staying on the ground floor is like part of a compulsion? I mean, like part of the- the ancient seeds. I wonder if that's that's a thing. I mean, listen, if you can't fall from a height if you're not at one. Well, it's true. It's true. I guess that's her, like, rebelling against the compulsion then, because she's on the ground floor. Yeah, I don't know. I guess, like, I said last time that that light was probably Sylvia, like, staying up, poring over the the notes and the books that she's stolen from Bonnie. You don't, you don't. You don't think that there's any anything spicier to it? I mean, I could say that it's Chi just, like, Doing like writing her own books. I'm trying to think what else could could happen. Yeah, like I f- I feel like it's gonna be if it's not just the landlady being creepy, it's probably Chi like I don't know drawing blood rituals on the wall. Let's say that. Uh, yes. Yeah, well, that that's <laughs> that's closer to what I'm looking for here, Herds. Because yeah. the, I guess the main criticism I have of your theory no. right now is that yeah. on the one hand you have this incredibly far fetched, ridiculous thing about this lunatic psychologist yeah. who has been hunting down children for decades. Yeah. And on the other side you have maybe her landlady's upstairs reading. And those two things, whilst compatible, do not feel congruous. Well, well hold on now. She'd be reading stuff of being creepy up there. But okay, I'll tell you what, maybe, maybe she's kidnapping people like she and she's holding them in her room upstairs and she's in i don't know doing more brainwashing i don't know what purpose that would serve other than just finishing what she started i don't know i don't know but like maybe we're gonna go and save chi maybe that's what bonnie's gonna do wouldn't that be great 
When are we going to find her like chained up or something? Are we going to save her? I'd, I'd enjoy that. I guess given, given that talk in chapter 11 about experiments, Herds, what, what do you, what do you think you can infer there about this supposed psychological work that Sylvia Slythe has been doing? Like what, do you reckon we're going to get get to the end of the novel and a, a puzzle piece is going to fall in place and you're going to realize that there was another experiment foreshadowed all along? Uh, probably. What what other experiment is... She- oh, no. I just want to be clear, Herds, because I don't want to do you dirty a second time in a row. <laughs> but much in the same way as I gave you a question like this in the Death in the Seaside-inspired novel Eight Detectives... I don't necessarily think I have an answer for this question, but I'm incredibly curious if your enormous intellect has managed I, to find one. I am pretty smart. Uh, you are very smart. Thank you. That's what That I, sounded way more sarcastic <laughs> than I meant it. You meant it. Sar- <laughs> what do you mean? How sarcastic did you mean it? Not, I didn't mean it sarcastically at all. It just sounded- All right. All right. Here we go. <laughs> I'm just trying to be nice to my friend Hertz. I, I don't believe it for a second- Okay, let me read you a quote here. (laughs) Having become interested in behaviorism, conditioning, and stimulus response psychology, I begged my parents for a kitten. And when we got one, I began to conduct behavioral experiments. And there's a whole thing where she whistles whenever the cat Mm -hmm. eats food. It's a Pavlov experiment. Uh, I mean, man, is this when I find out that she has like a code word that makes Bonnie want to smoke? Is that what it is? Is that anywhere in the ballpark? That would be fascinating. I'm going to have to go check, actually. I mean, the the obvious one is um is the the piece of paper that, like, it says, it, it might say nothing or it might say jump. Yeah. I, I like, if I'm going to pick, any, I, I feel like I haven't explicitly said this, but, like, I'm going to assume that the conditioning involves a keyword. It might literally be the word jump, or it might be, like, a phrase that triggers the jumping response. And I'm going to say that that's that's what killed Susan. That it's like a it's like a specific code word that compelled her to yeah. In the same way that peers compel Bonnie to to throw herself off of them. So to conclude, then yes, you think that Sylvia Slyth is a lunatic psychologist who is mad scientist. Yes, uh, out that's out great. here trying to experiment by compelling people to end their own lives in dramatic ways by the ocean. Uh, I, I mean, Susan might have just jumped off a, off a balcony window. Uh-huh. That was what was implied at the end of her last Still chapter. Still near the ocean, sure, though. Near the ocean, not necessarily into the you, ocean. You think that she has succeeded with mm-hmm. Susan? I think that she's trying to see if she can get Bonnie to do it now. That's why she's taking her to Seton. She's taking her to where all of her, like, stories and memories are leading her to see if she can get Bonnie to jump off a pier again to see if she can. And you reckon this is a, a bit of a lifelong thing. That's why she has knowledge on Bonnie's parents yes. and has been kind of doing this from a young yeah, age. Yeah, I think she's been following her for a while, you know, on Instagram. So she knows where she lives. Um. Uh, I guess my <laughs> last question is Herds, you know, not necessarily a point on this, but maybe, m- maybe a, a point saver if you drop one anywhere else. No, that doesn't bode well. Yeah. How, how do you, how do you reckon this ends? What how, does, does Bonnie fall for the compulsion does sylvia slythe get comeuppance and compels herself uh, that would be pretty funny uh, what what is what is what is the twist you you foresee I, mean, I feel like sylvia like i don't feel like she could just compel herself that is, that's that's magic like that feels like a step too far well, it'd be like maybe bonnie uh bonnie bonnie is being Pushes her? reverse engineering her and that's why she knows what happened to susan and that's why she be, she's been writing uh, what happened to susan i think the most like i feel like I'm I'm gonna hope for a less tragic ending than body like falling off of a cliff and and dying. I'm gonna say that she pushes Sylvia. I think that's probably the more like fun ending. Although does she have violence in her? Maybe, probably not. She's pretty like meek. I don't know. I don't know. I I'd, I'd vote for a, a less tragic ending. Just in general, I think Bonnie lives, runs away. Maybe she like lives with the. Uh, paranoid thought of whether Sylvia is still alive. Maybe Sylvia like falls into the sea and then Bonnie's like, did she die or is she just going to say jump again? And then I'll have to jump off a pier. And then she lives with that fear over her life forever. That seems, that seems like an ending. Well then, Herds, <laughs> I'm very excited for you to read the end of this I'm book. I'm terrified. I- <laughs> you should be. I just... 
I'm just so excited to find out what the heck was going on. Next week on the show, we are going to be covering all the way to the end of Alison Moore's death and the seaside. This is your murder mystery world tour here on 2SER 107.3. Flex and Herds joining you for a little bit of a weird atmospheric detour from our usual tomfoolery. Catch you next week with more death on the seaside. We're out of here.